Hello everyone and welcome to WCN World News. I'm Andy Klein. Well, today we go to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan to listen to Democracy Now! news host and executive director Amy Goodman. Democracy Now! is an independent news organization from the U.S. that's broadcast all over the world, and they do not accept corporate sponsorship. Today, Amy will be talking about the role and importance of the media, as well as the atomic bomb use on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and her extraordinary journalistic experience in East Timor. Stay tuned. I originally began at Pacifica Radio. Um, Pacifica was founded in 1949 in Berkeley, California, by a war resistor, a conscientious objector named Blue Hill. When he came out of the detention camps, he said there has to be a media outlet that is not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. As George Gerbner, uh, Dean of Journalism at the University of Pennsylvania, founder of the Cultural Environment Movement, said, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so Pacifica was born. First station KPFA in Berkeley, 49. In 1959, KPFK in Los Angeles, my station in New York in 1960, WBAI, station in Washington, and in 1970, uh, a sta station in Houston, Texas called KPFT in the Petro Metro, uh, that's Houston, uh, oil country. Now, that station is very interesting because in its first months of operation, KPFT is the only radio station to be blown up. It was uh, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Now, the silver lining was it's not as if Pacific had money for advertising. It certainly blew it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience of the people of Houston. And when they got back on their feet, um, the Klan blew it up again. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter. Um, I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops. Those are the titles of the leaders of the KKK, or the Grand Wizard. But he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is a Habakkasha from Hiroshima or a U.S. soldier who comes home from war psychologically or physically wounded, not to mention those who he or she may wound. To hear those voices, there is nothing more powerful than to hear someone speaking for themselves. I really do think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it's wielded as a weapon of war, and that has to change. What we get on the networks in the United States is the small circle of pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. No, we have to go into the communities of our countries and hear from those that are hailed as experts on the different issues, not the media appointed heroes or leaders, but those that people turn to in their own communities to hear their voices. And for those who are struggling to tell their stories until they can tell their own. Now, I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. Now, I don't know how many of you know that term. It's very big in the United States and it was invented by the Pentagon. The whole idea of embedding reporters in the front lines of troops, like in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I'm not saying these reporters aren't brave. They are. But what are you going to get from that perspective? You get reporting from the trigger end. We need reporting from the target end as well. What does it feel like to be in an Iraqi hospital in an Afghan community? What about embedding reporters in the peace movement around the world to understand the full effects of war? 
The media has failed us miserably. I mean, just look at the U.S. coverage of the Iraq War. I'm going to give a quick example. Um, six weeks before the invasion of Iraq, in February 2003, that's when Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, gave his push for war at the United Nations, which a speech that was the nail in the coffin for so many because he had been hesitant about war. And when he said that the evidence is in on weapons of mass destruction, um, it convinced many people. So a media watch group called FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, did a study of the two weeks around Powell's push for war. Now, this is a critical time. It's six weeks before the US invades. And it's a time when the media is, as Noam Chomsky says, manufacturing consent manufacturing consent for war. Now, half the population was opposed to war. Um, and so they looked at the two weeks around Powell's address. On the four major nightly newscasts, public television and commercial television, there were 393 interviews done around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? This time when about half the population is opposed to war. 393 interviews. Three. Three of almost 400. That is no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war, which is why we have to take the media back. I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, those who are concerned about the growing inequality between rich and poor, certainly it's the worst it's ever been in the United States, and it's growing around the world. Those who are concerned about climate change, about global warming, which doesn't just mean that the weather gets hotter, and the conservatives in the United States are all mocking the idea of global warming now because they say, you know, when it's zero degrees and uh, negative 50, but talking about Fahrenheit, uh, these crazy folks who talk about climate change, you know, how cold will it have to be for them to understand global warming isn't happening, they say. Of course, it's the opposite. It's about climate disruption the irregularity in climate that has changed so dramatically as the Earth heats up. But those who are concerned about war, inequality, about climate change, about the fate of the planet, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. And you notice I call it the corporate media, because I don't think the mainstream media is mainstream. Just look at the example of beating the drums for war in Iraq when <clears throat> half the population was opposed, yet you heard so few of those voices. There might be some similarity in the Japanese press now when it comes to the anti-nuclear movement, those voices we went the other night to cover the protest in front of the official residence of the prime minister. A couple hundred people were there, very animated. Um, but they represent, according to the polls, the majority of people in Japan, are you seeing that reflected in the media coverage of nuclear power and whether to revive it and continue it? It is so important we have a media that reflects what's happening at the grassroots and not just a megaphone for those in power. Not to exclude those in power by any means. We need a forum for people to debate each other, right? The President of the United States to debate a former um, to provide, I see the media as a great force that levels the playing field. You've got the corporations and the government, they, play penny, they pay plenty for um, public relations, for their spokespeople. The media should not be a megaphone for those in power. We are supposed to be apart from the parties, not a party to them. It's an uncomfortable position that we occupy. In the United States, journalism is the only profession that is explicitly protected by the US Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. Journalism is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. Now, it was a very moving experience to go yesterday to Hiroshima. I have been writing about Hiroshima for many, many years. In uh, our first book, I wrote my first three 
books with my brother David, who is also a journalist. First book called The Exception to the Rulers. Um, that should be the motto of all the media, The Exception to the Rulers. I mean, our second book is called Static. We called it that because in this high-tech digital age, with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths. Well, what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. That's the media that will save us. Now, this idea of reporters embedded with troops goes back. And it goes back to World War II. It goes back to the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, I wanted to talk about two different models of journalism. We wrote a chapter in Exception to the Rulers called Hiroshima Cover-Up, How the War Department's Time is Men Won a Pulitzer. And we began with a quote of a great American muckraking journalist named I.F. Stone. And he said, if you're going to remember two words, remember governments lie. And we are not, as journalists, supposed to act as a conveyor belt for those lies, especially when it comes to war. The lies take lives. I mean, look at the whole issue of weapons of mass destruction. But back to Hiroshima. We write, at the dawn of the nuclear age, an independent Australian journalist named Wilfred Bertret traveled to Japan to cover the aftermath of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The only problem was that General Douglas MacArthur had declared southern Japan off limits, barring the press. Over 200,000 people died in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but no Western journalist witnessed the aftermath and told the story. The world's media obediently crowded onto the USS Missouri off the coast of Japan to cover the surrender of the Japanese. Wilfred Burchett decided to strike out on his own. He was determined to see for himself what this nuclear bomb had done to understand what this vaunted new weapon was all about. So he boarded a train and traveled for 30 hours to the city of Hiroshima in defiance of General MacArthur's orders. Burchett emerged from the train into a nightmare world. The devastation that confronted him was unlike any he had ever seen during the war. The city of Hiroshima, with a population of 350,000, had been razed. Multi-story buildings reduced to charred posts. He saw people, shadows seared into walls and sidewalks. He met people with their skin melting off. In the hospital, he saw patients with purple skin hemorrhages, gangrene, fever, rapid hair loss. Burchett was among the first to witness and describe radiation sickness. He sat down in the rubble with his Hermes typewriter. His dispatch began, in Hiroshima, 30 days after the first atomic bomb destroyed the city and shook the world, people are still dying mysteriously and horribly, people who were uninjured in the cataclysm from an unknown something which I can only describe as the atomic plague, he wrote. He continued tapping out the words that still haunt us to this day. Hiroshima does not look like a bombed city. It looks as if a monster steamroller has passed over and squashed it out of existence. I write these facts as dispassionately as I can in the hope that they will act as a warning to the world, he wrote. Burchett's article, headlined The Atomic Plague, was published September 5, 1945, in the London Daily Express. The story caused a worldwide sensation. Burchett's candid reaction to the horror shocked readers. In this first testing ground of the atomic bomb, I've seen the most terrible and frightening desolation in four years of war. It makes a blitzed Pacific Island seem like an Eden. The damage is far greater than photographs can show. Burchett's searing independent reportage was a public relations fiasco for the US government and the military. 
General MacArthur had gone to great pains to restrict journalists' access to the bomb cities, and military censors were sanitizing, even killing dispatches that described the horror. There was a reporter, George Weller, who got in with the Chicago Daily News to Nagasaki. He wrote a 25,000-word story on the nightmare he found there. He talked about disease X. He, too, didn't have a word for radiation sickness. He just knew he saw something he had never seen before. But he made a crucial error. He submitted his piece to the military censors. His newspaper never got the story. As Weller later summarized his experience with MacArthur censors, they won, he said. U.S. authorities responded in time-honored fashion to Burchett's revelations. They attacked the messenger. General MacArthur ordered him expelled from Japan. Uh, he would later get his, the order was later rescinded. His camera with photos of Hiroshima mysteriously vanished when he was in the hospital. U.S. officials accused Burchett of being influenced by Japanese propaganda. The U.S. military scoffed at the notion of an atomic sickness, and so they invited reporters the U.S. military, to come to New Mexico, to the original test bomb site, to prove that there was no radiation, problem with radiation. Foremost among those reporters who were there was William Lawrence, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times, the leading science reporter in the United States. Groves trusted Lawrence to convey the military's line, and the general was not disappointed. Lawrence's front page story said, U.S. atom bomb site belies Tokyo tales. Tests on New Mexico range confirmed blast, not radiation, took toll. Interestingly, just a side note, the driver who drove Groves and the reporters and stood in the crater for being photographed by all these reporters later died of leukemia, and he was granted... Um, uh, service-connected disability payments acknowledging he had died of radiation sickness. Just a side tale. Lawrence quoted General Groves, the Japanese claim people died from radiation. If this is true, the number was very small. He said at the beginning, uh, the Japanese described symptoms that simply did not ring true. William Lawrence went on to write a 10-part series for the New York Times. He won the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. Oh, I forgot to mention that it turns out William Lawrence was not only receiving a salary from the New York Times, he was also on the payroll of the War Department, what was the original name for the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, interestingly, the War Department is now called. In March 45, General Groves had held a secret meeting at the New York Times with Lawrence to offer him a job writing press releases for the Manhattan Project, the U.S. program to develop atomic weapons. The intent, according to the Times, was to explain the intricacies of the atom bomb's operating principles in layman's language. Lawrence also helped write statements on the bomb for President Truman and Secretary of War Stimson on the payroll of both. When the Pulitzer Prize for this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, David and I wrote a letter to the Pulitzer Committee, and I delivered it to Columbia University, where I trained many of the journalism students at the Columbia Journalism School, where the Pulitzer Committee is housed, delivered that letter that said that the New York Times and William Lawrence posthumously should be stripped of that Pulitzer. It is not a model of reporting that we want to continue. It is absolutely critical that we be separate from the state that we report on what the state is doing. Interestingly, one other side note here, just coming from Kyoto a few hours ago. When Secretary of War Henry Stimson was handed the target list of uh, cities to bomb, he was going to choose which ones. He immediately crossed off Kyoto. Why? Because he and Mrs. Stimson had visited Kyoto. And it was a beautiful city, he said. He loved the people, the food, the temples. He could not destroy that city. Think about how profound that is. I mean, if only the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki got to host the Stimsons. But think of that lesson for the media, that if you know a place, if you've spoken to the people, if you've heard their voices, if you've tasted their food, it makes you much less likely to want to destroy it. That's the power of media. It introduces us to each other. It conveys a humanity and understanding what you think, even if I don't agree with the thing that you say. You know, how often do we agree with our family members? But we come to understand where you're coming from, and it makes it much less likely that people would want to destroy each other. 
I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Now, I know that we uh, want to open this, uh, this up to a discussion, Q&A, but I just wanted to end um, with coverage of East Timor, because I think it's also a very important message for the press. On the issue, by the way, of Fukushima, I think it is so significant um, that when you look at Japan today, Japan, the example, um, the fatal example of the dawn of the nuclear age, and what this development of nuclear weapons led to was nuclear power, and now being a victim of that. Um, it is so important that we hear the voices of the people most affected. Whether we're talking about 1945 and yesterday, I was toured through the area Ground Zero in Hiroshima via Habakusha, an 86-year-old man. When we got to the museum, he said, wait, 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 wait. Before you go inside, please just stand here. I said, well, but don't we want to go inside the museum? He said, no, I want you to stand here. He said, because people lived here. They lived here. And he showed me the rubble. And he said, those are posts for houses. That's China people had in their houses. He said, understand, people lived here. This isn't just about history. To hear his voice would change anyone. And so, let me end by talking about East Timor. Most of you probably know briefly the story of East Timor. In the United States, if you asked an audience, most would have no idea, even though we are so, in the United States, intimately connected to East Timor. East Timor is this island nation, you know, which um, was occupied by the Portuguese for hundreds of years. Um, but then they pulled out in 1974, and in 1975, Indonesia invaded East Timor. Not before, it was December 7, 1975, President Ford and Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State, visited Suharto in Jakarta and gave the go-ahead for the invasion. It was very important for Suharto because he didn't want to lose aid from the United States and military weapons. And if he engaged in an offensive act, he was afraid he would. So for the President and Secretary of State to give that approval meant that the bilateral relationship could continue. So as Ford and Kissinger flew out to meet with Marcos in the Philippines, the Indonesian military flew in. And by land, by air, and by sea, the Indonesian military invaded East Timor December 7, 1975. They closed East Timor to the outside world. 90% of their weapons were from the United States. The US armed, financed, and trained the Indonesian military. They closed the country to the outside world, the Indonesian military did, and the slaughter commenced. One of the great slaughters of the late 20th century. Um, for the next 17 years, in the US press and the corporate networks on the nightly news, the words East Timor were never mentioned, even though it was one of the great genocides of the second half of the 20th century. We certainly knew about Cambodia. Because the U.S., because the president, secretary of state, you know, Pol Pot was an enemy of the United States, and they would talk about it, and so the press would dutifully report. No, they should have. They should have reported on Pol Pot's atrocities. But when it came to Indonesia, Indonesian president was an ally of the United States. So the president of the United States and the secretary of state would rarely talk about what was happening, certainly wouldn't talk about Timor, and so the press didn't either. So over the next 17 years, the Indonesian military killed off a third of the population in East Timor, 200,000 people, proportionately larger than what happened in, uh, in Cambodia. I got a chance to go to Timor in 1990 and 1991 with my colleague, a very brave journalist named Alan Nair. In 1991, we got there at the end of October, and we went to the main Catholic church in Dili, uh, the capital of East Timor. You know, Timor is about 300 miles above Australia. And the women were wailing. And I didn't know if it was the standard sorrow of Timor or if something had happened. And we learned after the 
mass that the Indonesian military had surrounded the church, shot into it, and killed a young man named Sebastio Gomez. His blood was still fresh on the steps. The next day, they held a funeral for Sebastio, presided over by Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize with Jose Ramos Horta, who would then become president of Timor. Um, they held a mass and a funeral for him, and um, a thousand people marched to the cemetery. It was astounding to see. This is the end of October 1991. People putting their hands up in the V sign, shouting, Viva East Timor, Viva Independence, Viva Sebastião. I mean, most of them didn't know who this young man was. But the idea that the Indonesian military had violated the last civilian institution allowed to stand. You know, no unions could exist. Uh, there were no um, places where people could gather except in their churches. And that last bastion had now been violated. And I mean, this was a country where there was no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly, no freedom of speech. And the people simply marched. And they got to the cemetery. They buried Sebastio, terrified but exhilarated. We went around the country after that, waiting for a delegation that was supposed to come from the UN for the first time investigating this situation, the human rights situation. And we then learned that the Portuguese delegation authorized by the UN would not come. We later learned it was at the behest of the United States. For the first time, word would get out about what was happening in Timor. So two weeks later, when people were in total despair, because so many young people have gathered in the churches, dropped out of school and were left their homes because they wanted the protection of the church so they could speak to the delegation. They'd risked their lives to do this, but now they had no protection. Where do they go? Because the delegation wasn't going to come. So then came the morning of November 12th. We had gone around the country in asking people how were, was the Indonesian military preparing for the delegation. Everywhere we heard the same story. They said that the Indonesian military told them, if you speak to the delegation, we'll kill you after they leave. The line most commonly used, says Bishop Bello, will kill your family to the seventh generation. A nationwide death threat was issued. Two weeks after Sebastio was killed, after the funeral, the people held a commemoration procession. They went to mass in the morning. It was 8 o'clock. It was so many people at the Catholic Church, they had to hold the mass outside. And then... A thousand people came out of the church and thousands more joined them. The kids in their Catholic school uniforms pulling out uh, banners that were written on bed sheets. And you'd see marching down the street of Dili, a girl in her Catholic school uniform holding one end of the banner and an old woman in her traditional Timorese garb. And the banners would say, why the UN, um, not, you know, they would say things like, why the Indonesian military shoot our church? And um, they appeal to the United Nations to stop the slaughter. And, they marched through the streets of Dili, through this geography of pain. Whether they were passing a military base where Timorese were captured and killed, or whether they were passing a hotel where Timorese were imprisoned at the back, and they held up their hands in the peace sign. When they got to the cemetery, it's about 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm speaking very fast, and I apologize to the translators, but I know that we have very little time. Um, We were talking to people at the cemetery, and we asked them, why? Why are you um, protesting? Why are you risking your lives? And they would say, for my mother, for my brother, for my sister, for my village, it was wiped out. And then from the direction the procession came, hundreds of Indonesian military in uniform, their USM-16s at the ready position. It looked very threatening. And we knew the Indonesian military had committed many massacres in the past, but they'd never done it in front of Western journalists. And we thought maybe if we made ourselves, if we came to the front and made it clear who we were, it could head off the attack. I always hidden my equipment because we knew that Timorese would be in danger if they were caught talking to Western journalists. But now I took it out. I slung the tape recorder over my shoulder. I put headphones on. I held up my microphone like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head. We walked to the front of the crowd, the soldiers marching up 12 to 15 abreast. The people could not escape. There were high walls on either side of the road. Only people at the very back could run away. And the soldiers swept past us. They came around the corner without any warning, without any hesitation, without any provocation. They opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. The first to go down, a little boy behind us with his hands up in the V-sign exploded from the gunfire. 
uh, a group of soldiers came at us. They grabbed my microphone, waving it in my face as if to say, this is what we don't want. And then they threw me to the ground, beating me with their rifle butts in their boots. Alan got a photograph of them opening fire on the crowd. Um, and then he threw himself on top of me to protect me from further injury. And they took their USM-16s like baseball bats, and they slammed them against his skull until they fractured it. We were laying on the ground. He was covered in blood. The soldiers joined in uh, firing squad fashion, putting the guns to our heads, about 12 of them, and then more joined. And they were shouting two things. They were shouting politique and Australia. Politique, they were saying it was political that we were there. But that's our job as journalists, to go to where the silence is. And they were shouting Australia. They wanted to know if we were from Australia. We knew how dangerous that was. Because there were five Australian-based journalists covering the events leading up to the invasion in 1975. Uh, in a place called Valibo, and the Indonesian military caught them, and they lined them up against a house and they executed them. The final journalist, Roger East, was in a radio station in Dili the day after the invasion, December 8, 1975, and they broke into the radio station, they dragged him out, and as he shouted, he's from Australia, they shot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. So as we lay on the ground, Alan covered in blood, where we shouted back, no, we're from America, America. They kicked me in the stomach and I'd get my breath back because more would join in this firing line. I'd shout, America, America. Threw my passport at them. I was born in Washington, D.C. Um, they stripped us now of everything. It's the only thing I had left. And at some point, they did decide to pull the guns from our heads. We believe because we were from the same country their weapons were from. They would have to pay a price for killing us that they had never had to pay for killing the Timorese, and they moved on. A Red Cross jeep pulled up. We got into it. They picked up an old man who was beaten into a sewer ditch behind him. Every time he put up his hands in the prayer sign, they would, the Indonesian soldiers would take the butts of their rifles and smash his face, and the Red Cross driver picked him up, put him in the vehicle. We went into the vehicle. And then as we drove off to the hospital, dozens of Timorese jumped on top of the vehicle, hung off of the spare tire at the back, jumped on top of us. We drove as a human mass to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Why? I think because of what we represent to the Timorese, and I don't just mean Alan and I, I, I mean, and I don't just mean Americans, but people from the most powerful countries, I think represent two things to them the shield and the sword. The sword, because all too often, at least with the United States, the US uses weapons, like in Afghanistan and Iraq, or provides weapons to human rights abusing regimes. But they also see the populations of our countries as the shield. You know, they do everything they can do. They get gunned down. We can just call a Congress member and say, please stop doing this or supporting a human rights abusing regime. And they saw that shield bloody that day. The Indonesian military killed more than 270 people on that day, and it wasn't one of the larger massacres. We went into hiding, tried to figure out what to do, got someone to take pictures of us. They had confiscated everything from us, but just those pictures, even if they would deny that a massacre took place, what happened to us? And I hid those, uh, the film, we made our way to the airport, not before we went to the bishop's residence. Many were taking refuge there, and the bishop helped me clean up Alan. His head was just a glistening bathing cap kind of a blood under his black hair. His shirt was covered in blood. He, the bishop gave him a new shirt, and we thought if we could get to the airport before the blood came down again, maybe we could make our way into the only plane. Um, that was going out that day. We got to the airport. There was a big commotion. The military runs the airport. They were deciding what to do with us. Maybe there was a gap in communication. Maybe they already decided not to kill us and they wanted us out. 
but we made our way into the plane, the military walking alongside as we tried to get into this plane. Alan was so damaged, he was had electrical shocks going through his body. We didn't want them to see he had been so hurt, and so I kept stopping and saying, I just want to take one last look at this beautiful country before we leave. I had wrapped Alan's bloody shirt under a towel around my waist. If they denied anything happened, what's this? And so we flew from East Timor to West Timor to, um, to uh, Bali, to Denpasar, and there made the call to the Western world that a massacre had taken place and then made our way to the United States. Um, held a news conference at the National Press Club, explained what had taken place and that US weapons were used. And a nationwide movement grew up in the United States called the East Timor Action Network to stop the support of these, this murderous regime and what it was doing, that the US was facilitating. In 1999, the people of East Timor got to vote for their freedom. Overwhelmingly, in a UN referendum, they voted to be independent. For three years, the UN ran them, and in 2002, they became a new nation. Uh, I had uh, tried to get in to cover the referendum, and the Indonesian military caught me twice in Denpasar and Jakarta and deported me, but Alan did get in. And then 2002, on that day, May 20th, 2002, we did get in to cover Independence Day, the birth of a nation. How often does that happen? It was in a place called Tasitolo, just outside Dili. 100,000 Timorese gathered, and it was just about midnight. Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General, gave a speech, and then Shanana Gushmal, the rebel leader of Timor, long imprisoned by the Indonesian military, the founding president of a new Timor, got up and spoke in many different languages and unfurl the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. There was this fireworks display, and you could see the light reflected in the tear-stained faces of the people of East Timor. They had resisted, and they had won at an unbelievably high price, at an unacceptably high price. A third of the population died, but they had prevailed. And they thanked people, particularly from Western nations, who had told their governments to stop arming the Indonesian occupying force. And they are a lesson to us, I thought that night as I looked out on the crowd. Whether we are journalists or business people, artists, teachers, professors, students, employed or unemployed, they are a lesson to us every day whether we want to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy now. Out of And that was Amy Goodman speaking at the FCCJ in Tokyo. After her speech, the floor opened up to a question and answer session. Uh, I'm Kanahira, uh, working for uh, so-called Japanese mainstream media. <laughs> um, Which one? Thank sorry. you. Uh, PBS, PBS, Tokyo Broadcasting System. Uh, we met uh, at the Columbia University three years ago. Uh, thank you for your speech. I, I'm very impressed with uh, especially as uh, the two type of journalists cover, covering the Hiroshima bomb. Um, uh, my question is uh, some, some, some sort of uh, the U.S. military base question. Uh, I was back from, uh, this morning I was back from Okinawa. Uh, as you know, the new, uh, new mayor uh, was re-elected. He is strongly against the uh, construction of the new base in a, a small village in Oko. Um, you have been covering the many uh, communities which have the, the U.S. military bases around the world. Uh, judging from your experience, uh, do you think is it possible to pull out the U.S. military base eventually from Okinawa? Uh, because I, I, I'm asking this question because uh, uh, the U.S. military bases always have the, some sort of a friction or conflict between the local residents uh, near the U.S. bases and. Uh, some communities are treated uh, like a colony, and uh, local residents suffer from the discrimination, as you know. What do you, what do you <laughs> thought about this? Well, if I could predict things 
uh, I would probably be doing something else. But um, what I can say from history is we really can never predict what will happen. You never know. Um, I mean, look at the Philippines and what happened there with the U.S. military base and throwing it out. Um, look at uh, Occupy, the movement that took the United States by storm. Who would have predicted it the day before that that mass movement would happen? And by the way, on the issue of Occupy, if anyone doubts that it had an effect for those who say, well, the encampments ended and, you know, what was that all about? Uh, just say the word 99% and see if the person you say it to understands what that word means. Just that is such a profound, has had such a profound impact. And so what happens with um, a movement like this, you probably know more than me, the US is a mighty force. Um, but there is a force more powerful, both within the United States and outside, and it is the power of the people in um, making up their own minds what they want. Um, uh, and when those voices get stronger, the media, uh, even the media you work for, it has to open up. I mean, <coughs> these are papers and networks that rely on consumers of the news. And when these forces get powerful enough, they know that they are in jeopardy if they don't cover them. Um, I can't say what will happen. It's extremely interesting to be here and to talk to people, and that's going to inform my coverage and going back uh, to the United States for a daily global news hour, Democracy Now! Um, but we will certainly continue to keep tabs on it. Um. <clears throat> Three years ago, three and a half years ago, we went through a harrowing experience here with the Fukushima disaster. I'm curious to know your impressions as a journalist overseas, how that coverage that you received contradicts or compares to what you've actually seen and perceived being here on the ground in Japan. Well, it's a great moment to uh, congratulate David and Lucy Birmingham for their remarkable book, Strong in the Rain. Um, uh, I think we get a very different picture in the United States, what's happening on the ground, how I started the speech talking about um, public opinion here, that it's overwhelmingly anti-nuclear, although the government's trying to move forward in a very pro-nuclear direction. Um, it's extremely frightening uh, what we hear in the United States uh, about uh, the uncertainty, even today, of what could happen there. Um, what we don't get in the US are the voices of the grassroots movements here. And that's very important. Uh, when we went over to the official residence of the Prime Minister to speak with people there, people from Futaba and other places. We also spoke with the former mayor of Futaba, um, you know, just describing their very real experiences. And then Saturday night, I interviewed Naoto Khan to understand what was the official government position at that time. And there are a lot of similarities, I think, with the United States, the kind of forces at play, learning about what you call the nuclear village and the power of these corporations. We some, see something similar in the United States. Now, um, the lesson of Japan and Fukushima is not lost on the Obama administration. I mean, Fukushima has had a big impact on the American population. Most people have heard of it, and that's a big deal. You know, we live in a globalized world, but we are very insulated in the United States when it comes to getting information that really sinks in. But Fukushima does. And the reason why it's so important is that, I mean, in the United States, uh, the government and corporations haven't built a nuclear power plant in, what, almost 40 years. 
It's because of the anti-nuclear movement and because of the huge costs of building a nuclear power plant and the fact that no company is going to insure it. And so it's actually the people that have to, the government has to insure it. And also, what do you do with the nuclear waste? All of these questions. So it's gone on for decades that although we have uh, nuclear power plants, it's an aging uh, group of power plants. But interestingly, it's President Obama. President Bush could never have gotten away with it. But President Obama, because people would have said no. But President Obama has been the one to push forward with new nuclear power plants in Georgia and other places, talking about a nuclear renaissance. Uh, I think Fukushima has certainly thrown a wrench in those plans. Uh, people are deeply concerned and watching what's happening in Japan. Siegfried Kittel, uh, there's every year a poll in the United States about the uh, Japan-US security treaty. And in the last year, the support climbed for 20%. So, how, what, what, do, uh, what do American people think about the alliance with, uh, with, uh, between Japan and the United States? Perhaps even now in a in a, a time of a uh, army government with a more nationalistic, more aggressive policy <coughs> against uh, China. How, what, what do uh, American people think about the risk of war? Do they, would they support the American uh, government? What, what do you think? <coughs> um, I don't know that you know, the American people speak with one voice. Uh, and they certainly don't. And right now, people are very preoccupied with what's happening at home, with the economy, with the lack of jobs, with um, uh, just the crisis in our own economy. Um, uh, sadly, to be focused on what's happening here. But uh, I do think uh, being here and talking to people, seeing the effect of the United States on the kind of laws that are being passed, like the State Secrets Act that was just passed here, is a very serious issue. And we certainly know about the effect of the USA Patriot Act in the United States and the kind of criminalization of both journalists, a very serious issue. Um, you know, people being afraid to report on what whistleblowers give them, would it violate uh, national security? It's had a huge chilling effect on journalists and has had a huge chilling effect on uh, civil society. People being afraid to protest, will it violate this kind of vague term? And it's often kept vague so that you don't quite know, journalists or civil society in general, what it is you're violating. So you just um, self-censor. And that's not good for a democratic society. Um, either for people to be afraid to speak their minds or for journalists to be afraid to be able to report on the critical issues of the day that in a country in the United States that's increasingly secret, classifying information, um, what happens when you put out that information? In the past, we've had the great whistleblowers like Dan Ellsberg, held as a hero who helped stop the Vietnam War by releasing the Pentagon Papers. Um, but now you have someone like Edward Snowden, who's taken refuge in Russia, no, who knows what will happen next, who's, um, and even the journalists he spoke to, like Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, are afraid to come back into the United States. This is a great shame and a great scandal for democracy, what this means. Um, so I don't think I can comment directly on Japanese-American relations right now, what Americans think. Uh, it's not at the, you know, in the headlines, in the front pages of the papers or in the networks, but I can say that I see a lot of similarities between what's going on in Japan and what's happening in the United States. あの、
やってないにもかかわらずでっち上げられて無期懲役刑で39年間刑務所に入っています、えーさあのー、リン・スチュアートさんの解放に置かれるあのリモクラシーナウの働きなんかについてもとてもあの共鳴をあの感動を覚えてます。であの今あの日本の刑務所ではあの面会をするにも立ち会いがつきまた時間の制約があり30分っていう中であの暖房もなく冷房もないっていうとてもあの不自由な自由を奪われた、えー、状況を強いられていますでそうした日本の,あの政治犯についてのです、ね、状況について、えっと、どう考えていらっしゃるかということが一つ質問ですまた、えっと、ごめんなさい一つしか時間がないですねよろしくお願いします、はい So, so just for people who didn't understand that,、uh, Hoshino san's husband has been in prison for 39 years、um, for what his supporters say was a politically motivated crime. He, they say he's innocent and he's been kept、uh, in a prison very distant from, uh, from Tokyo uh, uh, in very uncomfortable conditions.、Uh, and she wants to know what's your view. Well, I would like to find out more about your husband's story.、Um, I'm flying out today, but I would like to be in touch with you.、Uh, and as for the situation of prisoners in Japan, I don't know that situation very well.、Um, I'd like to learn more, but I can say that、um, it's the United States that has the largest prison population in the world. It's not something that's talked about、um, very much in the United States. So there is a growing movement of concern. Around that.、Um, also, you know, in the US we have the death penalty. Do you have the death penalty? Yeah. yeah. yeah.、Um, and there are thousands of mainly men and some women on death row in the United States. Uh, um, uh, and this is an issue that Democracy Now! covers on a regular basis、um, is the issue of people behind bars.、Um, and also try to bring out those voices. You know, talking about going to where the silence is, it's no greater than.、Um, I mean, I can't think of a place where the silence is greater than when it comes to the coverage of、uh, prisoners. So, thank you for highlighting your husband's case. And、um, uh, it's an issue that we all have to cover in our own countries as well as places around the world. That was Democracy Now! news host and executive director. Amy Goodman speaking at the FCCJ. You can see Democracy Now! at democracynow.org and democracynow.jp. And to see our exclusive interview with Amy Goodman, please check us out at www.wcn-tv.com. And that does it for me. I'm Andy Klein for all the news that shapes our lives. Keep it locked right here at WCN.